Okay, good evening, good morning, good afternoon uh, to you all. Um, very happy to welcome you um, today in this uh, webinar series, which is organized by the Global Public Policy Network, or GPPN for short. This is a partnership of seven top public policy schools from around the world. And today's seminar is the second episode um, of uh, the network's inaugural thought leadership series. And we're going to focus more specifically on climate change and sustainability, featuring faculty from uh, different members in the GBPN network. A recording of the first webinar can be accessed on uh, your YouTube and uh, on the GPPN website. And the third seminar of the series will take place in April 2022, focusing on effective governance. But for today, we're very happy to be able to focus on climate change and sustainability. This is a very topical issue, and especially following um, the uh, uh, COP26, which is still fresh in our minds, we want to address how should policymakers, policy professionals, students of public policy um, can approach the public policy uh, related to climate problems, how we may think and look to governance, trade or diplomacy to move the needle and will sustainability emerge as a new dominant paradigm in the policy world. So. In this uh, webinar, we are going to uh, hear from thinkers and practitioners who have negotiated climate pacts, they have advised world leaders and authored seminar work on climate, sustainability, energy and the environment. And um, this will be a great pleasure to uh, be able to push them a little bit and to share their thoughts about how we may uh, continue the good work on this um, particular issue. So let me introduce uh, the speakers for this uh, evening. Um, we are going to have uh, three different uh, uh, speakers um, who will address um, uh, issues related to climate change and sustainability from different angles. We will be uh, starting with Professor Yun Arima, who is project professor at Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. He will be focusing mainly in his opening statement on priority gaps and other challenges related to climate change and sustainability. Our second speaker tonight and this afternoon will be uh, Dr. Benjamin Keshore. He's a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. Um, he will uh, focus in his opening statement on super wicked problems and how policy designs may help us to address and maybe crack down uh, the difficulties attached to, to those uh, public policy problems. Um, and our third speaker is uh, Nick Rowley. He's a senior lecturer in practice school of public policy at the London School of Economics. Um, he has uh, worked on environment, climate, and wider public policy in Australia, the UK, and internationally. And in his opening statement, Nick will challenge you, the audience in this case, the students listening to us uh, from all our, our different schools, um, as to where you can make a difference uh, as students, as today, and in your future career path. So those are the three different uh, speakers uh, for today. I myself will just introduce myself shortly. My name is Charlotte Halpern. Uh, I am based at Sciences Po in Paris um, at the Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics. And I'm a associate professor in public policy. Um, I'm also very sorry that uh, Christian Flaxland from the Hertie School was unable to join us uh, today. Um, unfortunately, um, he will not be able to join the panel, but I hope you will have other opportunities to talk and meet with Christian and listen to what he has to say on the, uh, on the topic. So before I give the word to our speakers, I will just briefly explain the structure of the webinar. I'm going to give the word to each of the speakers um, in order for them to have an opening statement, some seven to nine minutes, um, after which they will engage in a discussion or perhaps a debate with one another. Um, and in the second part of the webinar, we will be taking questions from you, the audience. So feel free to type in your questions or to comment in the Q&A session if you're joining us on Zoom. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, you are welcome to react, share and post your questions in the comment sections during the stream. Um, so let's start with our discussion. Uh, Professor Yuna Rima, we'll start with you uh, and your opening questions on the priority gaps and the challenges that we're facing at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. 
And then again, good evening and good afternoon and good uh, good morning to all of you. And then as introduced, uh, I would also talk about uh, the priority gap among countries, but not only that, uh, I'd like to also share my uh, say assessment of COP26 because I myself attended COP26 last November. And as you know, uh, COP26 is praised as a historic step forward uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius goals. And uh, frankly, I take my hat off to UK government uh, for their dip diplomatic skill uh, for working out such an ambitious uh, Glasgow Climate Pact. Uh, having said that, um, I also have a serious doubt as to whether a 45% reduction by 2030 in particular uh, could be achieved. And 45% reduction of CO2 by 2030 uh, calls for 7.3% reduction per annum uh, from now to 2030. So this uh, reduction exceeds 5.8% reduction in 2020 when the world was in the, um, uh, in the amid of COVID-19 crisis. In addition, uh, it is not conceivable that China, India, and other developing countries will change uh, their course of action uh, to absolute emission reduction from now instead of a gradual reduction of so-called CO2 intensity. Uh, more broadly, uh, the COP26 seems to have changed uh, the nature of the Paris Agreement. Uh, Paris Agreement was established based on the very delicate balance uh, between top-down temperature goal globally and bottom-up target setting by countries reflecting their national specific circumstances. Uh, this delicate balance is being lost uh, towards top-down nature. Uh, that is my impression. I'm putting particular attention on to the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal is akin uh, to setting a carbon budget from now to 2030, 2040, and 2050. Accordingly, a harsh confrontation uh, between developed and developing countries uh, could emerge over such limited uh, carbon space. And developing countries will certainly as developed countries uh, to accelerate their carbon neutrality goals well before 2050, and also to go on negative emissions so that uh, the additional space could be given uh, to developing countries. Uh, they will also uh, demand a significant increase of financial assistance uh, from current 100 billion US dollars per annum to 1 trillion US dollars per annum, as uh, Prime Minister Modi of India has proposed. So amid uh, the unprecedented fiscal deficit in developed countries, uh, this game uh, does not seem to go anywhere. And as I said, uh, there is an obsessive hostility uh, to fossil fuel, in particular coal, uh, which was uh, widely observed in COP26. But uh, this uh, does not match uh, the energy reality in the Asian region, where countries will continuously depend on fossil fuels in coming decades uh, for the sake of uh, affordability of energy supply. And then the uh, climate uh, action and uh, their priority among uh, SDG, uh, that is my key point. And according to uh, the uh, My World 2030, that is a global poll uh, conducted by United Nations since uh, 2019 or 20, and up to now over 500,000 uh, people have responded uh, to the question, uh, which SDGs are most important for you and your family? And choose uh, five SDGs. And according to the outcome, and while in Sweden, uh, climate action is an absolute number one priority, but in China, uh, the biggest emitter, uh, the climate action priority is 15th out of 17. And likewise, in Indonesia, 9th out of 15. So uh, in general, um, the higher the per capita, uh, per capita GDP, the higher priority is given to climate action. But uh, in general, uh, developing countries tend to put a more priority on health and, uh, you know, the uh, health care or uh, job opportunity or poverty eradication or uh, quality education and so on. And uh, the financial resources are finite. So how to prioritize uh, the allocation of financial resources, uh, that is a very difficult uh, question. 
and willingness to pay also matters. And 1.5 degrees will require at least 135 US dollars uh, per CO2 in 2030, or even more. According to the IEA's assessment, uh, in developed countries, uh, the uh, required carbon price would be 240 US dollars or something like that in 2025. And uh, we should recall that yellow vest movement in Paris was triggered by carbon price increase of just than 10 euro a pound of CO2. So average Americans willingness to pay is uh, less than one tenth of required uh, cost burden, uh, which Americans should uh, you know, shoulder. And uh, by the way, uh, the, uh, the uh, opinion survey conducted by Chicago University says that um, you know, the 70% of Americans are opposed uh, to the uh, carbon cost or cost burden, additional cost burden of 120 US dollars per year. And according to the IES analysis, uh, average American uh, should bear more than 1,200 US dollars per annum. So there is a huge gap. So when it is to pay, uh, will be even lower in Asian developing countries where uh, the incremental CO2 and energy demand will emerge. So this is a very much wicked and also inconvenient truth we, uh, which we have to face. And uh, the another point I'd like to uh, say uh, put forward is ongoing energy crisis. And um, you know, in particular, Europe is at the um, you know the mid of energy crisis, uh, where energy price, uh, electricity price, and the gas price are increasing several um, uh, sixfold or sevenfold. And the Ukraine uh, crisis is, uh, you know, putting further complication uh, to the situation. And in European energy crisis since last autumn has been at least partly caused by excessive reliance on uh, variable renewables and over reliance on natural gas as a backup power, and underinvestment in upstream oil and gas, uh, oil and gas investment. And while stagnant oil price and COVID nineteen has discouraged upstream investment in oil and gas. But, uh, you know, the, in addition, uh, decarbonization, uh, strong call for decarbonization has also been uh, very much influential in discouraging uh, certain upstream investment. Uh, the joint statement call, calling for the end of public support uh, to fossil fuel uh, sectors at the COP26 uh, symbolize uh, such, um, how can I say, stigmatization of the fossil fuels. So there is an um, apparent disconnect uh, between the COP world uh, re rejecting fossil fuels and uh, the energy crisis uh, calling for more fossil fuel supply. And in, in reality, uh, to curb energy prices, government are taking various actions, such as price subsidy uh, for gasoline in Japan and the release of SPL in the US and uh, freezing gas price in France and so on. Uh, while such policies are not consistent with climate mitigation objectives, uh, they show that if affordability of energy price is at risk, then uh, government will be obliged to take actions uh, for uh, protecting people, uh, people's life, and even though setting aside uh, the climate agenda for the time being. So uh, all of them are very much inconvenient truths, but uh, in discussing uh, climate actions, uh, we also need to acknowledge uh, these challenges. So uh, I hope uh, this could provide some food for thought uh, for further uh, uh, discussion tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Yun, for this uh, opening statement and uh, reminding us of what uh, the main challenges and priority gaps are when we discuss um, uh, issues related to climate change and sustainability. Um, I'm sure we'll have some opportunity to continue and, and pursue that discussion later on. I will now turn to Ben Kishore, who is going to uh, focus on um, uh, super wicked problems and policy designs and how policy may help us uh, address those specific public policy issues. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlotte, and uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning uh, to all of you, and wonderful to be here as part of this really important conversation on probably the most important problem facing this planet. I, I, want, I have a confession uh, to make. I was not uh, at the Glasgow conference. Um, however, 
I was at the, uh, the Bali COP in 2007, uh, where the world's governments agreed that they would finally find enough financing to address the deforestation and climate crisis challenge. I was at the, uh, the Warsaw Conference when they realized they weren't quite there and developed some more public-private partnerships. I was at the Lima Conference when they realized it wasn't quite enough in 2014. Uh, and I was at the COP 2015 uh, uh, climate conference in Paris. And what I noticed in all of these conferences was a phenomenon where you had um, what we and my colleagues referred to as a euphoria uh, creation phase of excitement around addressing these problems. Finally, this being the most important conference ever. And then depression when the actual implementation failed to take place. And so this is like Groundhog's Day for me. Every COP conference, the same lessons learned, the same problems are faced and the same depression occurs. And next year, we'll have excitement again. And yet we know, despite this euphoria depression phase, things are getting worse every year over year. And so for me, the question is, how do we break out of this cycle? What do we do? Um, this means standing back from particular pronouncements uh, where we, governments make commitments uh, or companies do as well and individuals that almost always are never met in the future. Not always, but usually they're not met. And then we try and find new ways and new mechanisms to address them. And instead, I want to ask, how do we stand back and change this cycle? What do we do as governments, as companies, as individuals? And I want to argue we begin with treating the climate crisis as an um, environmental super wicked problem. Now, let me be very clear about this. You guys all know the movie with Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, Don't Look Up, right? That was um, produced recently. And this is a movie of a comet coming to Earth. And people first think, let's solve the problem of the comet coming to Earth, because after all, it's going to destroy us. But eventually, we think about the comet as being not a comet problem to destroy the earth, but an, an economic problem or an economic challenge and willingness to pay calculations come in. And all of a sudden, we no longer think of this comet as a comet crashing at earth, but as a challenge that may or may not be solved depending upon how we feel about this comet. And I want to argue, we've got to treat the climate crisis as this comet coming to our planet. And the question isn't, do we address this problem? The question is, how do we do this? What do we do? So we've got to leave the whether we address it question aside and instead decide how do we address this problem? And to me, we begin this journey, which is an immediate pressing journey by disentangling um, four critical features of the climate crisis. And the first critical feature of the climate crisis as a super wicked problem uh, that I uh, created uh, uh, with my colleagues, Levin, Berner, and Alstead. Bern and, um, uh, Levin, Alden, Bernstein, it's getting late here, <laughs> um, is that um, time is running out. Now, we know this to be true and the comet metaphor tells us that and every year time uh, is getting worse. But this makes it a different problem than most problems facing governments around the world, where you can go back to the policy process time and time again, whether it's gun control, access to abortion rights, and so on. At some point, it's too late to act. And that means we have to think about this problem differently than regular problems, where cost-benefit analysis, willingness to pay surveys might play a more important role. But here, the issue is, ah, we must act because we know at some point in the future, it is too late. In the case of climate change, the science tells us that a CO2 emission sits in the atmosphere for over 300 years. And at some point then, tipping points will emerge regardless of our activities at some point in the future. And now many say we have eight or nine years to act. That's the first feature that makes it a clear and pressing danger that makes it different than the rest of the problems. The second problem, is that those seeking to solve the problem are also causing the problem. Now, this is very important. This is not a struggle against others, against other companies, other countries, other individuals. This is a struggle with ourselves. Most of us enjoy flying, 
than the economic benefits that come with a high carbon economy. But we also recognize the need that there is this metaphorical comment that we know we have to stop and we want to stop. In fact, most surveys do say um, that the public, the publics do want to solve the climate crisis. The question is, we've got conflicting interests and most of our um, uh, governing uh, arrangements at local, domestic and national and international levels tend to reinforce our short-term economic interests over our long-term environmental interests. So the issue isn't, oh, um, we don't want to solve the problem. The issue is we don't have the governance arenas and the policy tools applied that can, that can tend to our long-term selves. The third uh, key feature is that the policy interventions to date uh, discount the future irrationally. Okay, so the current policies in force, and we can go back to the IPC's first conference, 1992, uh, discount the um, uh, future irrationally. We do not mean, though, discounting the future rationally economically. We mean based on the climate science, the metaphorical comet coming down to crash into our earth. Uh, this science is so overwhelming, but none of our policies are consistent with this catastrophe that we are about to embark upon. And that irrationality requires a special kind of, of thinking about how to then do policy design. Now, the fourth feature is that there's no central authority. And we all know this. If there was, we wouldn't have these COP meetings um, allowing for voluntary commitments versus mandatory changes. Um, unlike, for example, the COVID crisis, where we had mandatory rules to constrain ourselves, globally, we have no similar government to force us to do things. And yet we know that an emission anywhere in the world has the same effect globally. Whether you're driving a car in Delhi, New York City, Singapore, Australia, the emissions are the same, and yet there's no collective government. Okay, we know all this. These four features, we argue, make them super wicked. But the challenge then is what to do. And we argue that whatever we do has to be designed in a way consistent with those four key features. So this means, we argue, the problem we're waging is with ourselves, and yet solutions then can emerge where we create some kind of policy lock-in, where we do something today that is so durable that as time goes on, it helps us reach our commitments, not avoid them. So we must design into the future in ways that actually entrenches our interests versus having our goals change or, or get pushed off. Now, I wanna give you one example of this and we can get more into the conversation afterwards, but a very practical example of a policy trigger that has been applied in the world to great effect. And I'm gonna argue we need more of these triggers. And this example comes to us from the uh, country of Germany that initiated the world's first feed-in tariff program. And essentially what they did is they said, okay, 15, 15 17 years ago, we want to find a way to decarbonize energy used in houses. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna give um, subsidies to homeowners who put solar panels on the rooftops, but they thought about stickiness. So instead of having simply a subsidy, they gave homeowners a contract, a, a 20 year contract with which they were guaranteed payments each year to help offset the cost of, of putting those solar um, uh, panels on the rooftops. But a contract, makes it more difficult for a future government to reverse course because of course you must pay um, offsetting um, uh, 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 cost to the, to the person whose contract you break. So that little small little tweak created a lock-in effect that helped therefore improve this program. But it went further because the government then said, you know what we're gonna do? If German homeowner, you produce more energy uh, than you use, we're gonna pay you the retail rate for excess energy that goes back into the grid. That did two things. That created a low carbon behavior, more Germans wore jackets in their homes to get this benefit, but then also created um, the um, uh, economic incentives to do so. This then created a norm among more and more Germans who didn't have this program that they wanted this as well. And all of a sudden politically feasibility changed as more and more Germans were calling for this program over time to get the same kind of benefits. But at some point, the economic benefits became a norm change. 
And you became actually an immoral citizen if you didn't have a solar panel on your rooftop. And guess what happened? Willingness to pay surveys changed dramatically. So they didn't take willingness to pay as given. They then uh, worked to change these calculations and change preferences to actually create um, the kinds of support for policies that could lead to a path dependent decarbonized future. And to me, that's a metaphorical example of how to um, address climate change as a super wicked problem. Thank you, Ben. And I'm sure we'll have some time to come back to you afterwards and to challenge you a little bit on those examples and to uh, provide us with some more details on how those combinations of path dependent policy mixes may, may function and might be overcome on the ground. Uh, so thanks a lot for this opening statement. We're now moving to our third speaker, Nick Rowley. Um, from the London School of Economics. Nick is going to play the devil advocates, I understand, and to uh, challenge a little bit the audience as to where they can make a difference or should make a difference. Nick, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Um, I've got some slides, but before I get to any slides and anybody talking about global climate change about to say that they're going to share slides should fill the whole audience with fear because you're going to see lots of X and Y axes and things are going to be looking pretty horrible and it's going to be very dispiriting, but worry not, my slides won't be like that. But as you've heard uh, my two eminent colleagues share their perspective, I really hope that everybody's been thinking about what has been said and is getting ready to challenge what you've heard. We've got three middle-aged men here supposedly very wise, affiliated with very fine schools of public policy. But don't be shy, tackle us, uh, nudge us, maybe jab us a little bit to elaborate on the things that we share. Um, as I heard the two presentations, I've got a few thoughts of my own. Um, uh, certainly when Jun talked about um, Paris and Glasgow and failure or success, one thing that really set um, Glasgow apart was the president of the COP, Alok Sharma, cried tears at its conclusion. That had never happened before. He was not overjoyed by the success of that meeting. Top down versus bottom up. I don't think that's a useful way to think about progress on global climate change. It's not either or. It's far more complex than that. And there are other ways of thinking about how progress can take place, not either at the bottom or the top, but in many, many places in between. And I'll elaborate on that. Jun talked about willingness to pay. Again, I think that this is a difficult way to think about the costs involved with tackling this problem, because we need to think very deeply as students of public policy, what it is that we're actually paying for. And we're not just paying for emissions reduction. If we can actually create a more stable climate through those reductions, then what we're actually paying for is pretty much any social, economic, or environmental policy goal that you might seek to achieve. It's one way of thinking about it. Uh, ben, I've been to too many UN meetings uh, myself. I think your characterization of them was pretty close to right. I, but I think I see it more as a three-stage process. There's enormous rhetorical hope. There are grand statements by David Attenborough, the Prince of Wales, and anybody else that can, can, can get some coverage about the need to act now, the time is ticking, etc. You then realize that, my goodness, we are going to fail. This is all dismal. It's awful. It normally happens towards the early part of the second week of any major UN conference. This train is going to crash. And then everybody stays up very, very late and the train doesn't crash, but it hasn't quite got far enough forward to actually do what it was required to do. That's how I see it. I'd love to read your paper. Um, I was part many years ago when I worked in Downing Street of initiating the Stern Review into the Economics of Climate Change. I like this quote from Nick Stern when we think about the global climate problem. A complex intertemporal collective action problem under uncertainty. And boy, if we're gonna tackle that problem, we need many, many more scholars uh, of public policy and practitioners of public policy 
who really understand it well over the coming years. So I'm looking at you out there in, in the world of GPPN to step up to the mark and help us tackle this problem. I really like the example that you shared in relation to feed-in tariffs. Um, my view is that effective climate policy needs to have two major attributes, stability and continuity. And time and timing is immensely important. The other example that I'd share is the Climate Change Act here in the United Kingdom, which sets up carbon budgets that are legally enforceable. That has enormous symbolic power across the whole of the Whitehall system, but also it means that pretty much anybody in the wider economy goes, how are we traveling in relation to our budgets and how we might be performing in relation to these things? So that's just my reflection on what I heard. I'm not suggesting it should have any greater standing than yours as the audience, but be ready to pick me up and others up in terms of what it is that you've heard. So let's go to my slides and I'm gonna be very quick. Challenge. Here we have uh, an eminent, an eminent uh, philosopher, possibly one of the most eminent philosophers uh, of the uh, previous uh, century, Karl Popper. There is only one excuse for a lecture. It is to challenge. It is the only way in which speech can be better than print. Uh, this was a quote well before Zoom, but we've done a lot of this. So let's try and get the dialogue going once I've stopped talking. Next slide. So I want to share three provocations. You must think I must only do things in threes. Uh, I don't, but today I seem to be doing everything in threes. So my first point is how should we think about the global climate problem? My second point is where can you, as students and aspiring practitioners of public policy, make a difference? And Finally, I want to reflect a little bit and just to share my perspective that this is no question of fate. This is a question of human choice. Next slide. This question of human choice was a point well made by uh, a former alumni of the London School of Economics, John F. Kennedy. Our problems are ours, therefore they may be solved by us and a person can be as big as they want. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. It's a nice phrase. I have taken out the gender specific language. There was a lot of man and men in that comment back in 1963, but it is a helpful way, I think, to consider that this is within the scope of our decisions. Next slide. My first point here, how should we think about the climate problem? Revealing the science is never going to be enough. I was listening to an interview with Christiana Figueres over the weekend, which was an extended interview. And she was talking about having just come off a meeting with a whole lot of senior scientists, all of whom were enormously deflated by all of the evidence and yet people do not act. Science deals with is questions, Politics and policy decisions are ought questions. They are never going to be solely resolved by referring to the science, no matter how compelling. And it is your point of view individually and us collectively that will actually help shape the future. And there's enormously interesting and important literature on the psychology of denial and how we need to think deeply about our position in the world and our relationship with nature, which is quite different between different people. Some people see nature as capricious, some people see it in just very different ways. I'm happy to share a reading list, but I just want to provoke. I was fortunate enough to advise former Prime Minister Tony Blair for two years on global climate change, and we got to a point when he would almost just refer to it as the problem. Because if you can think of any other major public policy challenge that you as a student of public policy care about, I would argue that none of them become any easier under a two, three or four degree warming world. They all, all of them become harder. If you think of it in that sense, uh, climate change is the sort of great escalator in terms of the need for effective public policy. Uh, an academic 
who I think is enormously useful on these questions. Uh, many of you out there, I hope, uh, will have been uh, reading and quite familiar with Elna Ostrom's work. Um, I think she's enormously insightful on how we need to think about the global climate problem and, of course, broader collective action problems. Uh, a fabulous piece that she wrote is the need for a polycentric approach to coping with climate change, not the top down, not the bottom up, but plenty of places in between where we can be working and doing good things and taking positive decisions that will have a meaningful difference, make a, make, make a meaningful difference. Next slide. So for students of public policy, where are those places? Well, we have a smorgasbord, if that is the correct Scandinavian term of choice in relation to where you might work uh, to make an effective difference, be that in science, be it in politics. I've got a nice picture there of uh, Marisa Rojas, who's the new environment minister in Chile, who's just been appointed an eminent climate scientist. Um, whether it's in government, here we have a rather large brutalist building in Tokyo where you can work if you want to work for the, for the Tokyo government. You can work in business. Uh, as a scholar of public policy, I would encourage you to be uh, not cynical, but sceptical of whether business is the place where you really can make a difference. I very much like this work by Peter de Verde, who's a Canadian academic. Uh, looking at what it is that large businesses are saying that they are doing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting... I, 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 anyway, you, you, you get the idea from the slide and I need to satisfy, I need to satisfy um, uh, the chair here to make sure that uh, I finish on time. So, next slide. Uh, Glasgow had a defined job. It was meant to give us the means whereby we implemented what was committed to in Paris, I believe failed in that task. We are now in a very different place. We are not in the science of prediction. We are in the science of impact, how big the impact will be. That image is from uh, Berlin, uh, uh, the richest economy in Europe uh, that was devastated last year in relation to severe climate events. This is about impact and we feel things. We are sentient beings. We are working at the intersection of political, policy, economic, investment, risk and opportunity, and it can go either way, but understand that there are real uh, tensions. Just want to leave you with one perspective. I like to think that I'm reasonably optimistic, but I tend to take the perspective of what is known as the tragic optimist. That doesn't mean that I'm tragically optimistic. I think that we face a tragedy. I think this is a potentially an existential problem for humanity. Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, one of the most brilliant books coming out of the Holocaust, talked about how do we respond when we confront tragedy? And he said the way to respond is to be positive, be optimistic, because that is the only hope that we have of meaningfully tackling that tragedy. Otherwise, we essentially accept our failure. Last slide, I'm done. Sorry to talk for too long. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you for finishing on this um, optimistic note, I'll put it this way. Uh, now, I think we are, before we turn to, to the audience and uh, please do um, send um, you know, whatever questions you may have, uh, for those of you attending on Zoom, uh, you may uh, send your questions um, um, in, the, in the chat, uh, in the Q&A section. Those joining us on Facebook Live, you're welcome to react, share, and post your questions in the comment sections during the stream, and I will be happy to convey them to the, to the speakers. But before we turn to the questions that we may have coming from the room, let me thank uh, the three of you for uh, sharing these thoughts as part of your opening comments. I actually had three well, let's say two follow-up questions that I'd like to come back to. Um, Yoon and Nick, both of you uh, have been uh, doing extensive work, both at university, but also working, advising government or working in government on the um, issues that we're discussing today, sustainability and climate change. One of the questions that uh, we get a lot from our students here at Sciences Po um, are regarding you know, how to transform 
um, the great work that has been done in science in order to gather the facts about the changes taking place and the environmental challenges that we're meeting that have been mapped out quite extensively lately, especially um, uh, by, uh, by scientists and, and highlighting, you know, the, 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 the range of the, the changes that are likely to, to under the dark that will come um, upon us very shortly. So that's that's one thing. But on the other hand, they always question, you know, the uh, uh, slow reaction or the lack of reaction or challenge uh, the different choices that have been made uh, in government and policy um, and question how to understand this gap. So I guess my question to both of you would be to ask you, you know, what is your feedback coming from this uh, perspective and this professional career on how to transform those scientific evidence, these facts, this great work that has been done in policy. Uh, what are the main barriers that are faced there? Is it a matter of translation? Is it in terms of training those policymakers into those challenges? Um, are, is it about a political uh, leadership and lack of political leadership? I mean, there are a number of factors that have been highlighted in literature, but I'd very much like to hear your views about this. Um, and so maybe you would you like to to start and Ben, I will have one for you later on, but maybe we can start with with them both and then we'll come to you in a, in a minute. So you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, how to translate uh, the scientific finding uh, to political action or policy uh, reactions? Uh, that is a very much challenging question. And I think that uh, many governments have uh, taken uh, various actions to cope with climate change. And for example, Japan has also introduced a feed-in tariff and um, uh, Japan is increasing subsidy for uh, you know, energy research and development and uh, strengthening policies for energy efficiency. But uh, there is certain limitation. Uh, that is, you know, the, uh, for example, in Japan, uh, the energy cost is already very much high among major countries. Uh, in terms of household electricity price and also industrial electricity price. And if we further increase energy cost, then uh, that could certainly damage international competitiveness of manufacturing industries in Japan. So uh, naturally, uh, there is a strong resistance uh, from business groups. And uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, we could not take uh, super ambitious actions. And uh, this uh, also uh, reflects uh, the problem of free rider problems, uh, which is quite unique uh, to climate change problem. Because as uh, Benjamin said, uh, the emission reduction in country A, that benefit is spread all over the world, though uh, the cost for mitigation needs to be borne by country A. And uh, you know, when Japan consider uh, the climate actions, uh, they naturally look at uh, actions by neighboring countries like China, Korea, uh, ASEAN countries, and the US. So if uh, they do not uh, take similar ambitious actions, then uh, there could be a relocation of production base uh, from Japan to other country. So uh, in the end, uh, the global emission uh, may not uh, go down simply uh, the shift of emission from country A to country B, a so-called carbon leakage. So um, how to cope with these problems? And I think, uh, you know, the uh, EU is currently considering uh, carbon border adjustment measures uh, for uh, assuring level playing field. I know that uh, France is a great fan of uh, CBAM. And I'm not sure whether, you know, to what extent CBAM could be workable because uh, it is very much technically complicated uh, to calculate embedded CO2 emissions. I put more hope on uh, the bottom-up actions by global enterprises. Uh, they are looking at a uh, carbon footprint of the products and services they are procuring. And I think uh, there is a growing trend uh, to demand uh, the carbon footprint uh, disclosure uh, by global suppliers. And uh, it is not governed by international treaty or it is not governed by government negotiation, but uh, the global industries are taking actions and that could uh, change uh, the behavior of uh, industries, not only developed countries, but also developing countries, because if uh, they cannot get into the supply chain of the global industries, that would be a great loss uh, for, those uh, for those companies. So uh, rather than, how can I say, uh, the uh, mandatory 
say, uh, trade, uh, punitive trade measures, I tend to put emphasis on uh, the, well, uh, bottom up, uh, the uh, global uh, enterprise actions uh, calling for uh, carbon information disclosure. So uh, that could change the behavior of the industry and then uh, that could facilitate um, more actions by the government in the end. Thank you very much, Yun. Nick, but how to uh, translate science into policy and, and speed up maybe the process? Uh, well, three things I think I'd, I'd share. Um, firstly, on the politics, uh, I still think we have a very unsophisticated uh, politics of climate change, unfortunately. I absolutely applaud uh, the advocacy over the past few years. It certainly keeps climate change on the agenda for policymakers. But uh, just getting people to state that we need to act on climate change without really addressing what that might mean in given contexts and the trade-offs involved doesn't really help that much. The politics is uh, dominated by the diagnosis it's really clear on the prescription. Uh, that doesn't really help people who are having to develop a new policy. Uh, second point I'd make if, if in terms of how we think about getting greater traction in relation to the need for effective climate policy. I think the core skill uh, in that environment is synthesis. I think one needs to synthesize the complexity around the risk and the complexity around the policy responses that one might seek to advocate and state it as clearly and compellingly uh, as one can. Um, and then thirdly, in terms of arguing for climate policy per se, one should always keep in mind the co-benefits. Uh, one is not going to uh, really win arguments solely, I think, in relation to policies being about emissions reduction and reducing risk for future generations or in time. I think it needs to be very practically positive and useful and beneficial uh, now. Um, and I think that uh, if you look at some of the examples of the positive transition that different countries have made from uh, high emissions uh, energy systems to low emissions energy systems, uh, that's been a reasonably painful, uh, painless uh, tra tra transition and, and quite positive. Uh, and can have major economic benefits as well. So those are three things. Think on the politics, focus on synthesis, and always be mindful of the co-benefits. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, now, turning maybe to, to Ben, um, I had a question for you, especially because in your, in your work, you focus in different regions of the world. So you've been doing some research in South Asia and Latin America. And, uh, the uh, the well the Northern Americas we could say the EU and I guess what I'd like to challenge you a little bit in the way that you've introduced um, the ways to deal with super wicked problems and more specifically to develop some uh, policy design and some uh, policy mix approaches to deal with that is how context specific do they have they been in your experience and how does this challenge their ability to actually address the wickedness of this public policy problem so how how did you compare them how did you across some regional differences, what is your stake on this? And I know you've done a lot of work, more specifically working on biodiversity and land conservation. So maybe you want to give us some uh, examples um, about this as well, because I think this is an area that you specialize in. Yeah, thank you. And, I, and I, I would argue the context specific isn't only across country, but across issue area as well. Let me give you one example. Um, in the 1980s, scientists told policymakers that factories in the Great Lakes area of North America were causing what's known as acid rain. Uh, and so what happened was the scientists told the government what had to be reduced um, from uh, the NOx and SOx emissions to, to uh, stop killing the ecology of the lakes. And what's curious about this is that under two very conservative leaders in Canada, United States, Reagan and Mulroney, um, they listened to the scientists. Um, there was no willingness to pay a survey. There was no information-based approach. There was a regulation capping the emissions simply based on the science of the ecology. Uh, and then what happened was uh, some economic tools came along 
to help factories meet those compliance mechanisms because some factories could actually reduce more than their quota. And this became the world's first cap and trade program where companies could trade their permits based on the, on the science of the ecology. But what's happened today now is instead of economists giving us the tools to address these environmental problems, we're now saying, unless we find an economic rationale, we can't address these problems. But that was never the case with the Great Lakes. Likewise, moving over to the US Pacific Northwest, another very different case on endangered species, the same thing happened. The scientists said, hey, you're logging in old world forests and the habitat of a Northern spotted owl needs those forests. If you want to conserve the viability of those owls, you must stop logging in those forests. And guess what, guess what they did, okay? Now this undermined the economy, unfortunately, but it, they did have subsidies to minimize those impacts, but they never actually said the owl saving was conditional upon uh, the economic benefits or willingness to pay surveys, just the opposite. So you can go across the world and find these examples of what we call actually thermostatic institutions or the policy response of the science of what's happening, not the eco economics about whether one should do this or not. It also happened in ozone where we see thermostats emerge as well. Um, and we find in biodiversity governance, likewise thermostats emerging around the world as well. So my point is let's not just compare countries, but let's find out where these thermostats are and try and design principles around them that doesn't ignore the economics at all, but it uses economics to solve the environmental problems rather than making the environment contingent upon converting it to an, environment, to an economic uh, problem. Thanks a lot, Ben. I think I have other questions of my own, but I think there are lots of questions already coming in uh, from the, Zooms, the Zoom webinar and uh, from the, the Facebook Live. So I'm just going to start to take some of the questions being addressed uh, to you. Um, so we have two questions that actually relate to uh, business communities. So I'm just going to raise them and uh, um, please let me know which one of you would like to address um, uh, the questions coming in. So we have one question coming in from Michael Yin. The problem of combating climate change lies in the lack of resources and knowledge to effectively mitigate the challenge as a community. How are universities working with the business community to do this? Um, and then we have a second question by Antra Maitra. Um, how do you think carbon heavy industries like steel, Siemens can transition and most importantly within time? Um, and how within each countries um, like India, how can one approach these problems, come up with viable solutions? And if linking this to the previous one, you know, how can universities contribute to developing this kind of solution? So I don't know if uh, Yoon or uh, Ben or Nick, uh, who of you would like to start? Yeah. Um... Yun, we do not hear you. I think we need to put your mic back on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the steel industry is obviously a typical example of a carbon intensive industry. And um, uh, how to reduce CO2 emissions? And we need uh, truly innovative technologies such as you know hydrogen uh, steel production technologies and so on. And uh, that is still very much expensive. So therefore, I think uh, the government and private sector needs some um, uh, redoubling or tri tripling uh, their R&D efforts. So I think uh, governments uh, should uh, provide more uh, R&D resources uh, for this technology development. And uh, perhaps I think, uh, you know, the steel producing countries uh, must share the same problems like India, China, Japan, and um, uh, Europe as well. And uh, there could be some uh, technology collaboration efforts uh, globally uh, across uh, the uh, interested countries. And I think ultimately uh, the climate change can only be uh, solved by uh, developing innovative technologies. So I think we tend to uh, put uh, too much priority on uh, target setting uh, with timetables like in Kyoto Protocol. But uh, unless uh, those technologies are available at affordable cost, then uh, it is not likely that India and China uh, will simply cut uh, their production for the sake of climate emergency. So I think uh, you know, the uh, joint development of those technologies are essential 
and the government can play a role, and certainly a uh, university uh, can uh, play a role in that endeavor. Thank you very much, Yun. Nick, did you want to address this? Yeah, uh, but the, the second question, who was that from, Charlotte? So if I remember the name, who was the second question? Uh, the second question was from Antara Maitra. I hope I'm okay. the, name, the name well. Antara, well, thank you. Uh, I think it's a really, really solid uh, question and an important one. Um, one way to think about it. Um, I heard someone say about a month ago that the only positive things that one can point to over the last 10 years or two years in response to uh, COVID-19, all of them, all of them have ultimately emanated from universities and from activity and research sponsored by universities. I thought that was quite an interesting way to think about the human response. I think we might, or I'm gonna give it a go anyway, is to expand that to when we think about the global climate problem, I think that the most consequential uh, responses and decisions need to be informed by thinking and research that emanates from universities. Uh, you might say, well, you would say that, Nick, because you're sitting there at the London School of Economics at the university. But I, I, think, I think there's something uh, to that. When you talk about uh, carbon heavy industries, um, I think we need to be a little specific about which industries. Um, there are certain industries, for example, like steel making, uh, that are at the moment extremely carbon intensive. There is there are technologies that could make quite a consequential difference on that through the development of green steel, particularly what needs to be combusted in order to create the intensity of energy required to create steel. Um, some of that might be uh, a fair way off, but one also needs to think about what is actually being made when you make steel. When you make steel, you make something that is actually going to be structurally in place for quite a long period of time. And it gets back to this timing point is there might well be some emissions associated with activity, that activity. But if the item that you're actually making has longevity and is robust, then that, that might also uh, uh, be a, a thing to think about and something that could actually be regarded as quite positive. What do I mean by that? Let's just expand it a little bit. As you walk uh, around uh, the town or the city that you live in and that you maybe work in, and you look at the buildings that are built within that, within that environment. Some of them may not be uh, that energy efficient, but they might actually have been built over 200 years ago. They've actually stood there and they've been maintained in that space. And over that period of time, the embodied energy put together to actually build that building uh, was embodied many, many years ago. And you might then walk past a very modern, very sleek, very nicely designed glazed building that might be star rated in relation to its, its energy use. But will that building actually be around in 50 to 100 to 150, uh, 250 years time? It's something I feel quite strongly because my hometown is, uh, is Sydney in Australia and there are buildings that have been built 30 years ago that are just not there anymore. And some of them might well have been performing very well in relation to their energy use. But in terms of the embodied energy in the building, uh, that's just uh, simply gone. Um, so those are, those are just some reflections on the question. Thank you very much, Nick. Ben, would you like to? Yeah, maybe just briefly. Um, uh, first of all, universities, including NUS, um, constantly engage in, uh, with the private sector and, and thinking about um, education and also unleashing technologies that can be um, low carbon and otherwise beneficial. I, I, I want to just um, pose a couple of points, though. Um, first, I think it's fair to say that most individuals and most companies and nonprofits and NGOs look at the climate crisis and they want to solve it. This is these, the battles with ourselves. Very few people say, I want to maintain a high carbon economy and destroy the planet, okay? So the people working in these, in these organizations are very ethical and very focused on these challenges. That's a given in most cases. The question is, when do you want to draw on businesses to address this problem? And for me, students of policy design 
have a really important task. One is to understand then when you simply need regulations to create incentives to um, reduce the impact of higher carbon uh, 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 businesses. But the other then is to think about how businesses can play a really important role in this policy mix around decarbonization. And, and my German government feed and care program is a very good one because companies actually grew out of that demand. So distinguishing then how policy can be designed to foster business uh, engagement with universities and with governments around decarbonization and distinguish that from those where that's unlikely is a really important, what we call fit for purpose type of policy analysis. Yes, thank you to the three of you. I now have two questions that have to do with the timing uh, of the changes and the policies uh, that uh, could be introduced and, and how to combine them with one another. So we have one question coming in from Melanie de Vicentes, who I take the opportunity to say hello to, she's a student at Sciences Po, um, and she's asking this question for everyone. As the impact of climate change are already felt across the world, we will have to invest in some form of adaptation while we work towards stopping our worsening of the issue. What are the conversations happening regarding the balance of investment in adaptive versus preventing strategies, prevention mm. strategies? Mm. That one question about how to organize and to time those two processes with one another. And we have a second related question from Minge um, asking, you know, climate change is not like a comet because the impact will be gradual and cumulative there. Mm. There's no one moment of impact, and so we will not know when it is too late to do anything. So I think this is really coming at you, Ben, uh, and the <laughs> analogy you made earlier. So the biggest problem is that those most vulnerable, the young, the poor, and the people in the less developed countries, are not in positions of power to effect change. How do you resolve this? Uh, so those are the two, uh, the two questions, and I think they, they, they challenge more specifically this issue of how to time things and who will it affect most and who who will lose in, in the process. Um, I don't know which one of you would like to start. Ben? I think Ben needs to, sure. need, needs sure. to defend it's, his it's comment. First of, all, <laughs> first, of all, you, first of all, great, great point on the comment. So that was a metaphorical yeah. point to reinforce the time is running out feature. And definitely any kind of super wicked problem, not just climate. For example, we argue that COVID is also a similar super big a problem, depends upon interrogating the time dimensions. So COVID was days, days and hours, whereas climate change is um, in years and decades. And a, com and a comet is, is, is more on the COVID side of things. But uh, it's not true though, that um, there won't be at some point where it'll be like, like a comet, because once we hit the tipping point, and the scientists are quite clear on this, um, it'll be catastrophic in its effects on this planet. So this, the, 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 um, the analogy is actually quite strong. We don't know exactly when that comet's gonna hit, the metaphorical comet, but it, when it does hit, it's gonna be catastrophic and we are heading for that catastrophe right now. So I think it's a very fair um, metaphor given, I don't quite understand yet why we're not treating it seriously and talking about willingness to pay surveys and that kind of thing. When we do have the very clear science telling us, telling this and, and the policy actions are not consistent with that, that science. Um, so th that I would respond, yes, I agree halfway, but not completely. This is a metaphorical comment that we're not for some reason, we're not looking up and it's time to, it's time to look up and, and see this, and see this um, metaphorical comment. Okay. I, 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 might, I might just say, um, just kind of back that in a bit. I mean, we don't want to stretch the metaphor too, too far but I do think it's a question of your perspective. Um, I think if you were in some of those German towns that were flooded last year, you were hit by a comet. I think if you uh, lived on the eastern seaboard, the seaboard of Australia during the 2019, 2020 bushfire season, you surely were hit by a comet. I drove down roads where there were thousands, thousands of dead sheep who had simply suffocated because of the smoke. Um, and it's true for people living in New York during Hurricane Sandy, et cetera. Um, I think the challenge is that that's for the people who live there um, and even for the people who live in those places. Uh, we come out of that period and we it will wake up the next day and it's not quite as terrible. I think that makes it difficult. The question that Melanie asked on adaptation and the balance between adaptation um, and emissions reduction, I think it's a really interesting one. And the whole debate between um, adaptation and mitigation has been an ongoing one. National Forum and in other places. 
Um, I'll just say a few things on that. Firstly, I think understand the limits of adaptation. There are certain climate effects that are simply well beyond any form of adaptation, um, simply because the prevailing uh, climatic conditions mean that one won't be able to grow crops, for example. So, you know, you can adapt to a degree to that, but there are real limitations to adaptation. But I think that uh, the emerging space now is the extent to which we have to go to, for a third factor as well, which is sequestration. It's starting to develop ways and technologies and working with natural systems to actually draw down carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, both adaptation and sequestration come with a whole lot of moral hazard, which I'm sure people would have thought about, because if one develops too good, too effective a capacity to both adapt and sequester, it actually legitimizes the continuation of emissions, which is exactly what we, what we, do, not, what we do not want. So these things are intention. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think we need to, we need to be aware of them and, and alert to, to how we need to move through time to respond in time. I very much like the way Ben emphasizes the whole timing element with regard to how we confront this as a policy problem. I think it's enormously important, critical in fact. Thank you, Nick. Yun, I can tell that you I, want yes, to address uh, this. Concerning the balance between adaptation and mitigation, uh, I have an impression that uh, you know too little resources are devoted to adaptation, while the majority of the international financial flow on climate-related areas are go to mitigation, and I think that is not the right balance. And as Nick pointed out, uh, there is certain sentiment among, say, uh, climate policy makers that uh, putting money on adaptation or sequestration is something like a defeat uh, to uh, the mitigation challenge. But, uh, you know, the, uh, so long as uh, the impact is emerging, I think a fair amount of money should be also devoted to adaptation. And I think uh, there is a not uh, the right balance. Uh, the current balance is not right uh, between mitigation and adaptation. So I certainly agree that more financial resources should be devoted to adaptation. And, uh, uh, and as a you know, starting point, uh, the financial resources need to be increased uh, for tackling climate change. But uh, the challenge is uh, there are many, many areas which call for more financial resources, like uh, poverty eradication or you know, the uh, hunger or uh, you know, the healthcare, education, and so on. So our financial resources are not, uh, fine, uh, are not infinite. So how to prioritize our financial allocation uh, to climate change? and how to allocate other financial allocation uh, between adaptation and mitigation. That's a great challenge. Can I just jump in here for one minute? Sure. Um, it's a very important uh, metaphor, the word balance. So by all means, there are very different goals here that require adaptation and mitigation. Um, and there are different problems as well. However, if, if governments and the private sector do want to address the climate crisis, then balance doesn't quite work because the scientists tell us, like with the acid rain problem in the Great Lakes, that 1.5 degrees is really what you want to stay um, below to avoid catastrophic ecological impacts that will then come back also as economic challenges as well. Uh, and therefore the idea of balance doesn't work because you're implying therefore you can, not, you can ignore the science on catastrophic impacts. And I think what you mean to say is, if you want to solve the climate crisis, we've got to find policies to get us 1.5 or less. And there are also other problems too we need to address as well. But the balance metaphor to me undermines the science of the metaphorical comet coming down. Mm. Any immediate reactions to Ben's point or I could see, no? Well. All right, so we'll continue with the questions. And I think we now have some, some questions coming in. Um, addressing not the timing, but really the location and where, where to lead those conversations and, and how they should be led and by whom. So one question from Cillian Kwa, uh, who is an alumni from the Le Kuan Yew, um, School of Public Policy, ask how should we go about coordinating climate efforts then? Is it a UN institution um, that has the, the right way to go, such as uh, the, the World Health Organization for Health? Or are we resigned to see unilateral action from countries who are determined to move faster? 
And he mentions more specifically uh, the uh, use carbon border adjustment mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and in relationship to that, there are two other questions, one from uh, Quang Chen Chang, um, who raises the following. What do you see as challenges faced by China and the US towards decarbonizing and carbon neutrality goals? Which country is doing it more effectively? So I think it also goes a little bit towards, you know, should some countries uh, uh, take the lead and, and move faster and how should they do that? Um, and similarly, we have a question also from a former uh, Lee Kuan Yew uh, School of Public Policy alumni, uh, Martin Stavenhagen, who asks, how do you feel about the potential effectiveness of the carbon border adjustment mechanism as planned by the EU? Do you think it would be effective to price in environmental externalities of CO2 at a global scale? So we have a number of questions um, in the Zoom webinar on um, 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 Facebook Live that addresses you know, the race to the bottom or the race to the top that the countries are leading and where to locate the conversation and highlighting some of the shortcomings of the global um, uh, networks and the global facilities that exist at the moment. Um, so maybe, Yun, do you want to start with yes. some uh, of Thank you very much. And um, a lot of questions about CBAM, uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Measures, uh, which is under consideration by the European Commission. And uh, the objective of the CBAM is to ensure a level playing field uh, between European industries and uh, other countries' industries um, where uh, the governments are not taking as ambitious actions as the European Union. And uh, their basic idea is uh, to, put, to put some sort of carbon tariff on certain sectors such as steel, cement, uh, fertilizer, and electricity, and aluminum. But, uh, you know, in accordance with uh, more ambitious actions that are taken in European Union, then uh, there will be an overall energy cost increase. And that will impact not only these five industries, but also all the industries will be affected. So uh, how the CBAM can be expanded uh, to cover all the other sectors, including, say, assembling uh, industries and manufacturing industries and so on. And uh, there are very complicated issues how to calculate embedded CO2 emissions of the products which goes through a global supply chain. And also uh, the carbon border adjustment measures uh, predicates uh, the existence of um, uh, expressed carbon pricing. But uh, in the US, uh, under the current congressional situation, uh, it is not at all likely that carbon tax or emissions trading system uh, can be introduced. So there is a very much little possibility of the uh, policy coordination between EU and the US uh, for uh, carbon border adjustment measures, unless uh, the implicit carbon pricing calculation is embedded in that system. So um, at this moment, um, I'm not 100% convinced about uh, the effectiveness of the carbon border adjustment measures. And uh, certainly uh, such country as Russia and India, uh, Ukraine and, uh, and, such and Turkey, uh, they are reacting very much harshly uh, to the carbon border adjustment measures on the ground that uh, it is something like a disguised uh, protectionism, um, you know, the, uh, in, under the name of the climate mitigation efforts. So, and uh, that could certainly, uh, say, uh, easily lead to trade war and uh, retaliation and so on. So, um, well, uh, the judge is still out <laughs> about uh, the effectiveness of the carbon border adjustment measures. And uh, the EU will be obliged to get into the dialogue with uh, possible trading partners uh, about uh, before introducing carbon border adjustment measures. And that discussion needs to be observed from now. Thank you. Nick or Ben? I have to say, I have uh, loads of questions. So feel free you know, to come in very quickly or to tell me if you'd rather skip and so we can move on, but it's really up to you. Uh, look, I'll, I'll just go very, very quickly. One thing that uh, I think we all need to uh, appreciate, um, whether when we talk about uh, carbon border adjustments or anything else, is that climate policy is very immature uh, environment policy is immature if you compare it to uh, health policy, transport policy, defence policy, or other areas of policy which have histories going back centuries. Environment policy itself only has a history going back just over 120 years or so. 
And the first bit of uh, policy, I would say, uh, or legislation anyway, that really had as its goal addressing the global climate problem uh, was in California in the 1990s. So there's a lot of learning by doing that we are all engaged with in terms of people who are seeking to understand the policy response uh, to this challenge. So uh, that's, that's probably all I'd say. Maybe I could just come in on that. I, maybe it depends upon our definition of environmental uh, policy, but certainly in my world, uh, these go back quite, quite historically. And you can even go back to the Native Species Act in the United States of 1973, which explains then so much of the reasons for these, these conservation efforts later, and even back to the 30s and 20s. Um, but I think the issue around the policies around decarbonization and how there's so many uh, technical aspects and then become also political. And the thousands of possibilities a la German government speed and care program to be unleashed and distinguishing those from that don't have a chance of making a difference. That's really tough stuff that really requires in-depth analysis that I agree needs to be really brought to the forefront. But I would make one point on this, um, you know, the border taxes issue. And the question ought to be, why are we just, why are we having these policies now? What's the reason for them? Is it because of the, the, we finally found the magic bullet or is it because of some kind of politics is getting in the way of the magic bullet? I mean, we know from the Stern report, we know from my colleague Vino Thomas that actually carbon taxes would be the most efficient uh, approach if people would actually initiate them and they could be quite fast and, and effective. Um, but they're not happening for political reasons. We know that 92% of emissions come from the, came historically and today together, cumulatively, came from the North. Yet these things kind of penalize the South in some way. So we, we do want to ask what's going on with those motivations and whether that means if the answer is, yeah, there are other motivations, what, what does that mean for the climate crisis is a very important question for me, um, given the, the nature of the time is running out aspect of these questions. Thanks to you, Ben. Now I think we have a completely different um, issue coming in. Uh, question raised by Clemence Den Clemens Denner. Thank you for the great discussion. I would be interested in your take on climate change activism and the recent radicalization of some groups like, like uh, Extinct Rebellion. Do you think this is necessary to shift public and elite opinions or does it lead to the complete opposite? Nick, does this fit into the tragic optimism narrative? Uh, <laughs> so this is, <laughs> this is one question that we, we got. And then there is uh, the two questions which I will um, bring together with, with this one also in the hope that this way we can you know, address uh, the, the largest number of questions. There is one from Laurence Madweki Obewe from Nigeria. She asks, while the world is focused on climate solutions, it must also consider that most less developed nations depend on some climate harmful resources for economic survival. How can such nations be moved to more sustainable alternatives using public policies? And uh, a related one by Indra Malo, uh, which uh, is more specifically uh, addressed to uh, Nick. Do you think um, the UNFCCC Clean Development Mechanism should extend its carbon credits take, uh, trade efforts to include all countries' projects and not just developing countries so that the mitigation activities are more universal? So those those are the three the three questions uh, I've been picking and selecting in the in the of questions we are receiving. Okay, okay. Well, uh, shall I just try and be as quick as I can and as direct as I can and respond to Clemence in a in a in a direct way. Um, the politics of climate change uh, continues to uh, to um, emerge. I think there are certain developments over the past few years, which I think have been very positive. I think Fridays for the Future and Greta Thunberg have really uh, brought to the fore the intergenerational aspects of, of, of the climate problem and the need for decisions to be taken now uh, to secure uh, some form of secure uh, uh, future. I think that that's kind of uh, positive, but I think that, um, and I fear that the, the politics might actually uh, become more extreme. And already we've seen examples of that uh, in Australia and in other places where people have been looking to engage in actions which actually stop coal uh, being moved around uh, from where it is to where it needs to be. Um, I, I fear that that might only become more intense. 
Uh, I think if you look at organizations like Extinction Rebellion, though, um, as someone who really needs to turn your mind to what policies might be, um, I, I don't think that Extinction Rebellion has been particularly uh, useful uh, uh, in relation to that. And if there were one thing that I really hoped for would be that uh, more people, more intelligent, um, uh, educated, informed uh, young people with a real interest in policy and policy responses, I would like to see more of them actually working within organisations, within government and within politics to inform the decisions that need to be taken to reduce the risks of global climate change rather than campaigning from outside of the tent. Um, because I think we, there's, there's, a, there's, there's an absolute need for people with the sorts of skills that students at any of the GPPN schools um, uh, are getting uh, and have uh, that need to be applied in terms of informing the decisions that we collectively need to, need to take. The question in relation to the clean development mechanism, yes. Thank you. Rick, um, Yun or Ben? Uh, yes, uh, concerning uh, the uh, CDM, and then uh, we should call it now as um, uh, Article 6 mechanism under the Paris Agreement. And that is not limited to uh, the projects in developing countries. And I think uh, that could be applicable uh, to all the parties. So I think it is not uh, limiting the possibility of the carbon uh, trading uh, between developed and developing countries. Uh, that would even be possible uh, among developing countries and between among developed countries, I think. So that is my interpretation. And concerning the climate activism, uh, I tend to agree with uh, Nick that uh, you know the uh, they have played a role uh, for elevating uh, the um, you know the attention of climate change uh, to uh, the ordinary people, but uh, if they become too extreme and if they neglect uh, the other problems, uh, for example, Greg Thunberg uh, said in a general assembly in September 2019, said she said that uh, economic growth is a fairy tale. And that is not necessarily, how can I say, appropriate comments, um, you know, the, given uh, the economic reality of many least developed countries. So they also need economic growth and climate actions both. So uh, negating uh, economic growth for the sake of climate change is not interpreted appropriately uh, by the global uh, public. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Yun Ben, yes. Yeah, there's so much, I wish we had more time on this question. Um, yes, let me you, just have, first, you have two minutes and a half. Two minutes. So first two of minutes. all, yes. we know historically that environmental movements have played a significant role in the creation of meaningful legislation across the world and the environment, period. So we don't want to discount that. They've been significant and really important, um, uh, not just in Europe and North America, but around the world. Um, of course, we all would accept that they should be done peacefully. But that's one thing, let's just make, be clear about that. Secondly though, I would argue, and I do argue that actually the real action right now is in policy design. Uh, uh, so we've got attention now, but how do we trigger these decarbonization pathways quickly and effectively in line with the problem to me is the most pressing challenge facing the planet. And we're not designing well enough to kind of refer back to what Nick was saying. We're just getting there, but we need to roll up our sleeves be much more, much smarter and much more creative and unleash way more German government feed and terror programs than we've ever done before. But distinguish those from the ones that are actually are not around decarbonization. And that's a difficult task. We have, we have to do that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stop there given the time, but you know, I, I think Greta has been important rhetorically, but let's now get a roll apart sleeves and design some policies that can be effective too. I agree with you. Yeah, Th thank you very much to, to the three of you. I think, uh, Nick, you incidentally uh, addressed uh, one of the questions that was asked uh, by Antara Mitra about what is expected from new generation, next generation policy professionals. And I think you all uh, included this in your answer. So that's that's great. So that's a, a, something we, we, we answered. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry uh, to the audience because there were a lot of very interesting questions uh, in the chat, but I think we already did quite a good job in addressing at least half of what was raised uh, today. So I would like to thank um, the, our three speakers, um, Nick Rolly, uh, Yuna Rima, and Benjamin Kishore for taking the time uh, to uh, address 
uh, uh, all those questions and to provide some lively answers to uh, the questions raised. I'd also like to thank the audience um, listening here today uh, from uh, uh, all our universities, so in Japan, in France, in the US, uh, in the UK, um, and in Singapore. I also would like to thank um, some of our audience from Bulgaria until Vietnam. So I think there's at least some 29 countries represented uh, today. Uh, so which is quite a nice range um, of um, uh, attendance. Um, so let me also introduce the third webinar. Uh, you will need to watch this space. If you enjoyed tonight's discussion or this afternoon's discussion, join us for the third webinar of the series. It will take place in April. It will be on effective uh, governance. Um, and this uh, um, uh, information will come to you in your mailbox. Um, and in order to do that, you need to join our mailing list or check the uh, Global Public uh, Policy Network website for updates. Um, we also would like you to um, give us some feedback. Um, and before you leave, we would really appreciate if you would give us some feedback on your experience here tonight. And in order to do this, please click on the link in the chat comment section or scan the QR card uh, that you can see um, on the screen. So that um, is all from my end. And again, thank you very much for a very good discussion and for a lively evening, afternoon. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank look you. up, look up, look up. <laughs>